The Barclay Marathons, a brutal ultra-endurance running race covering 160 kilometers and 18,000 vertical ascent meters. I mean, think about how crazy that is. That is going up and down Mount Everest, not once, but twice if you were to start from sea level. No surprise that only 20 people in history have made it to the finish and interestingly, just last week, the first woman, called Jasmine Paris, has finished this race. To finish such a race, an athlete needs to expend an enormous amount of energy. In this video, I want to discuss how much and what athletes have to eat based on the energy requirements of running such a long time. So if you are a person who likes to run, bike or swim very long distances, this video is definitely for you. So without further ado, let's dive into the science. Hi everyone, I'm Gomar. I'm a senior scientist at ETH Zurich based in Switzerland. I've spent the last decade of my life studying the interaction between nutrition and exercise. I've published dozens of peer-reviewed papers in this field and now I want to provide some of that science back to you guys. So let's look at the basic data of the Barclay Ultra Marathon race. You have five loops and per loop you have to, as an athlete, uh, complete 20 miles or 32 kilometers with an elevation gain of 32,000 feet or 3,600 meters approximately. This would add up to a total of 100 miles and 18,000 meters of vertical ascent. That is also why people are considering this uh, ultra marathon race as one of the hardest or maybe even the hardest to complete. The maximum completion time, important point here, is 60 hours. This means that you have to run on average 2.67 kilometers per hour continuously to make the 60 hour time cap. So I was watching, I got some inspiration for this video because I was watching a documentary from a fellow Belgian uh, guy called Karel uh, Sabbe who actually finished the race in 2023 and he just published a beautiful documentary. I will also put it in the show notes uh, of, of this, of the description of this video. And what was interesting, and, 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 and I didn't really expect this, he was um, obviously not much talking about his nutrition, but you saw that he was uh, sporadically drinking some Coca-Cola, so not really like a Powerade or something else that is maybe more sports specific. And also he was saying, yeah, I need to get some food in. And then he was saying, yeah, maybe uh, I can get a hamburger in or a burrito. Do you want to go to a place where you can eat? Do you want to eat a so I can get a little bit of a Can you pass the best too? Yeah, that's what I want. And what do you do? It's a to me. So, I mean, from what I could understand, his, his food intake was not completely optimized to the detail to complete such a hard race. So I was thinking, is there actually some data out there um, that shows how much energy athletes expend dur during such a race and which energy uh, or, or where the energy is derived from, from fats or predominantly carbohydrates or also some protein and so on. So that's why I stumbled uh, upon uh, some, some very, very interesting case reports. Um, for example, here, uh, this, uh, this study, they looked at the physiological responses and nutritional intake during a seven-day seven treadmill running world record. So what was this, this study all about? It was a 47-year-old uh, woman who was an ultra-endurance uh, athlete and she ran continuously for seven days on the treadmill in uh, three-hour blocks followed by always 30 minutes breaks. And she slept four hours a day from, from uh, 1 to 5 a.m. In total, she completed 833 kilometers um, in these seven days. So really an unbelievable uh, yeah, case study of an athlete who could kind of keep running forever. And what the, the people did here, because this was done in a lab, they could measure their her uh, nutritional intake very meticulously and also how much oxygen um, she consumed and CO2 she expelled. Uh, and also measure some cardiorespiratory and subjective measures on how hard it felt throughout the race. So that's obviously the, the benefit of doing such in a laboratory. You can measure the physiological variables very meticulously. 
So have a look at her uh, total calorie intake. And this was very surprising uh, to me. So the first day she could actually eat quite a lot. So here you can see, this is the, the column, the total calories. She ate 3,600 uh, kilocalories, uh, so many uh, carbohydrates and so on. So most of it was, was so a high percentage was carbohydrates. So she was not like on a keto diet or, or whatever, uh, some protein and, and some fat. But then this actually went down dramatically. So 2,400, 2,600 and so on. And even at the last day when she was still running like 20 hours a day she ate a measly 700 uh, kilocalories all right so that was that was quite interesting uh, for me and i want to know like okay but 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 uh, what, what, what is this all about um and if you look at a little bit more in detail she was eating approximately uh, 22 um, grams of carbohydrates per hour on average so 22 grams of carbohydrates so in the beginning as i said it was a little bit better but then she went down to 15, 16, and even at the end, she was uh, averaging seven hours, uh, sorry, seven grams of carbohydrates. So that's that's obviously uh, not a large amount because um, most of the sports sciences say, so just look at, at this, uh, this, this part of the graph here. If you have a longer duration of exercise, for example, ultra marathon, obviously, which is a long above or far above 90 minutes, you should try to have a carbohydrate intake of 60 grams per hour to sustain your pace or to sustain uh, a high intense uh, pace. Obviously, she was not uh, getting those amounts. And even, in, for example, in cyclists who also go at high intensity for a longer period of time, uh, we recommend or scientists recommend up to 90 grams of carbohydrate consumption per hour. So she was definitely not, not getting there. So look at a little bit, uh, and that's why this study or this case study is so interesting. We could look at her energy uh, consumption because we can estimate this by um, if we know how much oxygen she uses or consumes and how much CO2 she expels, you can do with some um, calculations. You can uh, assess how many calories she, uh, yeah, she expends as well as from which uh, energy source, the, sorry, from which source the energy is coming mostly from fats or mostly from uh, carbohydrates. And that's exactly what you see here. She was working at approximately 50% uh, of her maximal oxygen uptake. So that is for most people a very easy zone two, how to say it, uh, pace. Obviously, because she had to run so long, her pace was around 60 uh, to 50% of her VO2 max. And interestingly here, the RER, which is a respiratory exchange ratio, which is a measurement of how many relative carbohydrates versus fats she consumes all right so rer basically is just the amount of co2 she uh, expels um, divided by the amount of o2 or oxygen she consumes and if you uh, add those or, or you, you calculate those you come to a certain number and this is number is going from 0.7 to 1.0 and 0.7 means that she's 100 percent relying on fats for energy. So 100% fats is 0.7 and 1.0 means 100% of carbohydrates. For example, during a CrossFit session, we are above or at 1.0. This means that you're only um, expending carbohydrates. While, uh, for example, during such a long run, she is approximately 66% relying on fats. So a high percentage uh, and 33% of carbohydrates. So not only fats, but a large percentage is uh, on fats. And there we know how much she ate, exactly how much she ate because of our nutritionists that were providing and weighing her food as well. We know almost exactly or to a very close extent how much energy she expended. And here there's a clear misbalance or a disbalance um, and we, we come to an, an energy deficit of 21,000, approximately 21,000 kilocalories. This means 48,000 kilocalories of expenditure and a 27,000 approximately energy intake. So she was running this whole period on a large energy deficit, which is, I think, very interesting to understand. While she still broke the world record and obviously this, 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 this still worked for her. This is from another paper where uh, they did a similar uh, case study and I was thinking like this is almost impossible, so high caloric deficit, but still also another paper found exactly the same. So here uh, the person did a, a marathon on a treadmill every day for 10 days just also in the lab. And then um, she also ran for 43 hours. So 
quite close to what, what people do in the Barclay Marathon, although obviously there, there's more uh, essence and it's still harder, but, but, but uh, we're getting to, towards the same point. And you see the red bars here, the red bars mean the energy deficit. And also it was the same, 1,000 to 2,000 kilocalories of energy deficit each day. So um, what happens then if you go in such a large energy deficit? So there we have to look at, um, yeah, so, so how much energy there's actually stored in the body. And you see here that, for example, in this case, but also in other uh, cases that I, that I looked up into the literature, people lose approximately 2 to 3% of body weight during such a long ultra endurance event. For example, here she went from 51 to 48 kilograms, and um, it was mostly body fat that was reduced, 2 kilograms approximately, and then also muscle mass, in this case 400 grams. This depends a little bit on the study. Sometimes they show more muscle mass loss, sometimes they show a bit less muscle mass loss energy deficit this means okay she didn't eat enough energy or di didn't eat enough uh, carbohydrates and fat during that time but obviously the energy has to come from somewhere and if you for example would um get to this caloric deficit of only by only burning muscle let's say you only burn muscle to to uh, accomplish the energy deficit or to 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 uh, uh, make sure that the energy de deficit is is fulfilled you are um, needing to uh, approximately five kilograms of muscle. If you're only gonna burn sugars or glycogen, you will have to burn approximately 5,000 grams or five kilograms of sugars of glycogen. In fat, you only have to burn 2.3 kilograms of fat. Why? You can see it here at the top, because one kilograms of muscle or sugar is approximately 4,000 kilocalories. It's just energy stored within that tissue. And one kilogram of fat is much more energy dense, and therefore you have 9,000 9, kilocalories in one kilogram of fat. So even though she went in a quite extreme energy deficit, she only lost two kilograms of fat. That's actually not so much. If you think about it, she definitely has seven to eight kilograms of fat. So based on her, let's say, capacity, she could have kept on running because she still probably did have some, some, some more body fat during that run, which is, I think, quite interesting. All right, so, so let's look at the Barclay Marathon. Let, let's go back a little bit. Um, so as I said, there's approximately 11 hours of continuous running uh, per loop, all right? So this uh, accumulates to around 55 hours or 3,300 minutes of continuous running, approximately to make it uh, the finish. And if you look at the data, so look at here, the, the, the middle part, the middle rectangle, we are looking at eight to uh, 13 kilocalories per minute a person is expanding when the person depends a little bit on the height obviously and, and on the weight of the person when he or she is running at 60% of their view to max which is the, the average uh, let's say intensity of ultra marathon runners all right so as i said rer would be on the low on the on the fat side 0.8 or maybe 0.85 um, so meaning predominantly uh, fats in this case so this means to to just extrapolate because we don't have real data from the the people who finished the um the barclay marathon um the total caloric expenditure to finish such a, such a six uh, uh, 60 hour race would be 26,000 on the lower end and let's say 43,000 on the higher end let's say for the females rather it's going to be 26,000 and for the, the larger males it's going to be rather 43,000 of kilocalories a person needs to just complete the full Barclay um, and this would accumulate to approximately 3 to almost 5 kilograms of body fat. So even though this is an extreme endurance race um, the capacity of the body to provide that much energy and to go in such an energy deficit is actually there. Um, everyone has at least five kilograms of body fat, even when you have a very low body fat percentage. So that's why I think it's interesting to understand that um, you can actually go into a large energy deficit without fully depleting your capacity. So as I said, uh, Karl Saba, he was drinking sporadically a Coca-Cola. As I said, I don't know his, his whole um, yeah, uh, food uh, scheme and what he ate, but I also would assume he was in a large caloric uh, deficit. And so I calculated just for, for fun how much Coca-Cola he needed to, to drink to actually um, not go into an energy deficit and to, to, to top up his, his calories that he expended. And this would go from 600 to 1,000 cans of Coca-Cola. All right, so that's the amount of sugar, if you think about pure sugar, he would actually uh, burn. Burritos, 
35 to uh, 57 uh, amount, so total amount of burritos. Obviously, there's more calories in the burrito, so that's why he, uh, yeah, he obviously has to eat many uh, less burritos, but I doubt that he actually uh, was able to uh, get so much, so many calories in because when I look at the literature, most of the people were actually saying or describing that gastrointestinal problems, so problems with the stomach, are actually the major determinant or, or difficult part of running for such a long time. It's very difficult during running uh, to keep the, the, the fluids and the food inside the, the, uh, the stomach and to actually digest the whole uh, the, the, the food. So if you look at, um, so then we can think about, okay, so you are probably going to be in a caloric deficit. I mean, it's nearly inevitable. So every calorie you take in um, needs to be the most efficient uh, way or, or as efficient as possible to get into um, your, your body, obviously. Uh, and then we have to look at the different types of carbohydrates. You have monosaccharides. You also have disaccharides and you also have uh, polysaccharides and so on, but let's not talk about those ones. And um, it's interesting that it seems to be a combination of glucose and fructose. When you take those combinations in, you have, let's say, more oxidation or you have the more the ability to oxidize more exogenous carbohydrates uh, coming from, for example, a drink or a bar. And therefore, I was a bit interested and a bit surprised that uh, Karel Sabe, who actually finished the race, so he definitely did, a, did an amazing job, was actually drinking Coca-Cola because it's, this is, let's say, suboptimal. It has a low pH. It has CO2 inside, so it can also blow up the stomach. And um, it doesn't have the optimal, let's say, not concentration, but ratio of glucose and fructose. Uh, as you can see here, if you look at this, this table, uh, during such races, he should aim to get around 60 grams of carbohydrates per uh, hour, maybe even 90 if he's very well trained. I am very doubtful that he was able to do this because I think just running, I mean, I'm not an endurance runner myself, is just much more difficult. Because if you see, for example, the Tour de France riders who sometimes also sit six hours on the bike at very high intensity or at least high intensity, they are actually able to consume up to 90 grams of carbohydrates per hour. This is actually a big thing in the peloton uh, now. So I think it has to be has, has to be something with the weight bearing activity of running. And indeed here, a study uh, from, from in Frontiers in Nutrition from, from 2020 showed this, that if an athlete uh, or, or a person ingested glucose plus maltodextrin, which is actually basically uh, glucose uh, put together, um, or fructose, plus maltodextrin, so fructose plus glucose. Um, in the latter, so the fructose plus a maltodextrin ratio, he was, or they were able to oxidize more carbohydrates and, and, and obviously provide more energy to the body, which is obviously super important during such long endurance events. All right, so um, this is, uh, I think, the take home, and then we can get to the take home of, of let's say, ultra uh, marathon running, which is obviously a very fascinating topic, and it's 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 really pushing the boundaries of, of uh, human endurance and maybe even animal endurance. Um, what I found interesting and and what I didn't know before myself is that the energy de deficits usually reported in literature are up to fifty percent of total energy spent during such an ultra endurance run. So these people go into severe energy deficits. It seems to be, let's say, in, impossible or nearly impossible to eat a sufficient amount of food during such a long run. And um, that is because the intensity is relatively low, it's 50 to 60% of their VO2 max. Um, they are mostly relying on fats, but not exclusively, important point. OK, so because they are mostly relying on fats, they can actually sustain such a large, large energy deficit. If a pro bicycle rider, like a, a pro um, Tour de France rider, would have to rely mostly on fats for his energy provision during a stage, he would never finish first. Because obviously the fats or when you uh, provide energy via fats, there's a lower power um generation than when you uh, provide energy via carbohydrates so, so less um, ATP per seconds with fats compared to uh, carbohydrates um, so the fat to carbohydrate ratio is approximately 60 to 40 percent on average and the goal for such an endurance run sh should be around 60 uh, grams of carbohydrates per hour if you can Obviously, it depends. You have to train the gut, therefore. You have to train uh, everything uh, to, to, to be able to do that. And it should be preferably in a 1 to 0.8 glucose 
to a fructose ratio. Good. All right, that was it uh, for today. I hope you, you found this uh, perspective on ultramarathoning and, and, and just uh, uh, understanding a little bit more what ultra endurance events entail related to energy expenditure. I hope you liked this kind of video. If you do, give us a like. This really helps out the channel. And I uh, hope to see you in the next one. Ciao.